Anderson Cooper, AC360, CNN Weeknights, 10 Eastern. When did you realize something was wrong? It was in the middle of my tour for my, my memoir, uh, my Hitch 22. And I, I was feeling a bit ropey, but I, I wrote it down to overwork. And I rather enjoy the feeling of burning the candle at both ends and, you know, living a 36-hour day. Mm -hmm. But it abruptly was borne in on me that that was an illusion. I, there was a morning came, I couldn't get out of bed. I was, my, something was obviously wrong with my heart and my lungs. This was in New York. You felt it as soon as you woke up? Oh, yeah. And I couldn't move, really. And um, I thought, no, this is, this is not, you know, there's an expression about, um, I woke up feeling like death. Mm -hmm. I've had that. <laughs> but this was not <laughs> like that. You had some rough mornings. This was like that. This uh -huh. was, I, th I thought, maybe I'm dying. So I managed to get to the, to the phone and call the emergency services. And I had got an obstruction near my heart, and my lungs had filled up a bit um, with fluid. But that was quite easily taken care of. Then they told me, they, after they looked at the scan, you need to see an oncologist. The first time I'd ever really listened to the word, to the name oncologist. Mm. And I thought, it's a bit nicer than being told you've got cancer, but not much. And when you found out what kind of cancer it was, um, it's the same sort of cancer your, your father had. Yes. Yeah, one of the first things that I thought was, that's what killed the old man. Mm -hmm. Because um, my dad died of a heart attack when he was 50, and I really don't want to die of a heart attack. Like, for some odd reason, yes. the idea of dying, it's not even the age thing, it's just th having that for some reason. So did that cross your mind? No, you don't feel any filial piety about the disease that killed your father. <laughs> uh -huh. no. um, and then the second thought was a, a rather selfish one, I suppose, or self-centered. I thought, well, he lived to be 79. I'm 61. So that question, why me, came across your mind? Well, you can't. You can't avoid the question, however stoic you are. You can only bat it away as a silly one. I mean, billions of people die every day. Everyone's got to go sometime. Um, I came by this particular tumor honestly. I mean, if you smoke, which I did for many years very heavily, with occasional interruptions, and if you, um, if you use alcohol, you make yourself a candidate for it. And that's in what your 60s. You, you said, I mean, you, you burned the candle at both ends, mm. you, you think. And it gave a lovely light. It gave a lovely light. But do but you think part of that, the way you lived, is responsible for this? Well, it would be very idle to deny it. And I might as well say to anyone who might be watching, if you can uh, hold it down on the smokes and the cocktails, you might be well advised to do so. That's probably the subtlest uh, anti-smoking message I've ever heard. <laughs> well, the other ones tend to be rather strident. <laughs> That's true. And for that reason, easy to ignore. Yeah. D does it, I mean, hearing that word, oncologist, hearing the word cancer, does it, I mean, it obviously changes one. It changes one's life. But, but how do you think it has changed you, if it has? Mm, famously, people say it's too early to say. Um, I don't feel, um, well, change my life. I and mean, what it's done is um, make it much, in prospect, much shorter. That's the overwhelming objective fact, even if I, as they say, beat it or out, outdo it in some way. Um, survive it for a bit. I'm, I'm certainly in the closing years of my life. And, and so you, you're kicked upstairs, so you're kicked forward quite a lot. It's very hard to think of it. People encourage you to do this. That's just an episode in your life, or something among the many things you'll be able to look back on. You can't quite do that, or, or at any rate, I can't. You, you've you've written. I don't want to maul the words, but basically that that if if life is a race, you, you are now a finalist. Yes. Yeah, and I'm, you, and I'm much nearer the finish line and you without having that. run any faster or done any exertion, let alone taken any exercise. And does that make you want to do something differently now? Or, or I mean, obviously there, you, you've said that the, there are many things you had planned to do over the next 10 yes. years. Once you've decided you won't ask yourself the silly self-pitying question, why me? Or go into the anger phase that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talks about. Once you realize all that's pointless. The, the phases of, of the five denial, phases right. of denial: you know, uh, anger, denial, bargaining, acceptance. Grief is in there somewhere, I think. Um, I think, it's, by the way, it's a very bad guide. But why is it a bad guide? Well, because the anger stage would be pretty pointless. That that is like saying, "Why me?" It's, it's silly. So you haven't um, been angry. Denial is pretty hard once you've talked to any serious doctor. Um, the bargaining bit is more interesting. I mean, they say, well, you trade 
your hair, um, several pounds off your weight, um, quite a lot of your peace of mind, you know, your digestion, um, and then you might get better. That's a reasonable bargain. And then other people say, well, if you'd only make yourself right with the supernatural, um, you'd be better. That would be, that's another form of bargaining. That's Did that ever cross your mind? No. no. I mean, er, even people who don't believe, when faced with something <laughs> overwhelming, might try to, you know, hedge their bets a little bit and, you know, make a bargain with God or, you know, talk to God a little bit. Have you, yes. have you done that at all? Well, actually, Christianity asks you to do that while you're still healthy. It's a very famous um, uh, chapter in the, in the writing of Pascal. It says it's a, it's a wager. If you bet on God and you're right, you win everything. You've everything to gain. And if you don't and you're wrong, then you've everything to lose. I think that's a very shady kind of bet. So there's never been a moment where you suddenly... So you, it's like saying, give up your self-respect. Pretend you never thought any of the things that, you, that were your, the, your principles in life. Uh, make yourself abject and you might have a chance. I think that's sorted. So you, but you say you're making bargains. Who are you bargaining with? Well, in the Pascalian case, you mean all the... Well, you, you, you know, you said you give up your hair and, and yes. maybe get more time. Um, do you see that as just a, a theoretical... I mean, other people would be bargaining with, with well, it's God. it's more like a negotiation. It's a process. It's just something you have to do. But it's not with a higher power or it's... No. It's not. Uh, because... Well, medicine has improved, often in spite of religious teaching that said you have to accept God's verdict. Um, there are a whole number of new treatments. I'm quite willing to be a guinea pig for this. I, I wouldn't mind, even if it didn't work for me, I wouldn't mind being an experimental subject. It might be a contribution I could make. But also, you can't quite crush the hope that one of these new cancer treatments might come in time for you. And there are amazing strides being made in oncology. So you are hopeful? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not fatalistic. I'm not resigned. Um, but I'm realistic, too. The statistics in my case are very poor. Not many people come through esophageal cancer and, and live to talk about it. Or well, not for long. And the other wager is, or well, the part of the wager, is it's a certainty you'll have a terrible time and you may wish you were dying because it, it's, a, it's an awful process. That you can't escape. You're going to get that no matter what. And then the, the torture period may or may not be worth it, or it may be torture followed by an execution. The, I know you know that there are people praying for you. There are prayer groups, actually. And, and you've talked <laughs> about that a little bit. Um, what do you think about that, the fact that people are praying for you? There are people who are praying for me to suffer and die. They have lavish websites relishing my... Really? Oh, yeah. And then there are people, much more numerous, I must say, um, and nicer, <laughs> who are praying either that I get better or that, it, that I um, redeem myself, that I make peace with the Almighty. That, that and that my soul gets saved even if my wretched carcass does not. Um, and some pray for, pray for both. And in fact, the 20th of September has been designated um, Everyone Pray for Hitchens Day on one website. In case you want to mark your mark the calendar for that. I shall not be taking part in that. Um, so you don't pray at all? No. No, that's all that's meaningless to me. I don't think that souls or bodies can be changed by incantation or anything else, by, by the way. So do you tell people not to do it for you? No. I say if it makes you feel better, then you have my blessing. Does it make you feel better? No. The most careful study of prayer that was ever made was about three years ago. It was called STEP study of the therapeutic effects of intercessionary prayer, found that there's no correlation at all between how much people are prayed for and how well they do. But there's one small negative correlation. Some believers, knowing they're being prayed for by their congregation, genuinely, sincerely, when they don't get better, feel worse hmm. because they feel they've let people down. Hmm. That won't happen to me or doesn't, but I have a secular equivalent of it. A lot of you will write to me saying, you can beat this thing you're a tough guy. If anyone can, you can. We pity cancer for taking you on. It's bound to lose. All that. We're very nice to them. And I, some days it's depressing because I think, well, if I check out, I'll be letting down all my comrades. Strange, irrational feeling. It, it's, it's interesting hearing you talk about it. it, it it's, I mean, obviously you are 
an intellectual, and you seem to be dealing with it in an intellectual way. I mean, is that does that make sense? I mean, it, it, you you seem to be looking at this, trying to look at this as rationally as possible. What about the emotional side? Well, let's say as objectively as possible. Objectively, yes. And I mean, to my slightly to my own surprise, because I'm not by any means um, tear proof, I haven't wept at any point yet. Maybe that's to come. Um, but I've become moist when I think about my children, for whom it's a, a nasty shock. Incidentally, whatever God is punishing me, according to the other prayer faction, is punishing them too. I don't know if they think about that. Uh, the, on the, just one more thing on the prayer group thing. Do you, do you appreciate the, the gesture? Oh, yes. Yeah, and often it comes from people who I've had debates with in the past on religion, in their, in their churches or in their synagogues. Uh, people who found me a very fierce antagonist and um, think that in some way, some bits of me are worth saving. So no, I take that kindly, of course. No, um, I wouldn't want to be churlish about any, any expression of, of concern, but I, I think I probably can't keep the slightly pitying tone out of my voice that anyone would think that the natural order containing as much mystery and um, immensity as it does could be altered by incantation. In Vanity Fair, you wrote, I am badly oppressed by a gnawing sense of waste. I had real plans for my next decade and felt I'd worked hard enough to earn it. Well, I really not live to see my children marry, to watch the World Trade Center rise again, to read, if not indeed write, the obituaries of elderly villains like Henry Kissinger and Joseph Ratzinger. Yes. That's important to you. Oh, very, yeah. The, the, one of the things, again, it's only partly rational, but I think of, is uh, outliving certain people. And um, I used to think that before I was sick, of course. Even now, you don't mind taking on the Pope. You're not hedging your bets at all. Not at all. No. Um, in fact, now more than now more than ever. You remember there was a very uh, funny cartoon in the New Yorker a few years ago. It was drawn by Roz Chast, mm -hmm. and it's the view over someone's shoulder of a man reading the obituaries page of the New York Times, and the little bubbles all across the page read, "Same age as me, younger than me, uh -huh. <laughs> two years older than me." And so. Yeah. That is, in fact, what people are thinking after a certain age when they read the obituary pages. I'm, I'm not exempt from that, that pettiness, I'm afraid. Um, you started the, the memoir. But I mean, I also did wish to see my children married, yes. Yeah. You, you started the memoir after seeing a, a, a photo of yourself and the line underneath it said, the late Christopher Hitchens. Is that right? Yes. What about seeing that made you want to write a memoir? I mean, how did, how did seeing yourself described as the late? I mean, this yes. was obviously before your diagnosis. Well, I was already engaged on the memoir, but I got, a, I got a frantic letter from the National Portrait Gallery in London saying that an image of me in one of their magazines or catalogues had mistakenly described me as the late Christopher Hitchens. It was transposed, sadly, from the caption that did apply to a friend of mine whose mm -hmm. picture was also in there. Mm -hmm. um, and I can just tell you, if you read about yourself in the past tense, it concentrates the mind immediately. <laughs> and then I thought, well, I've joined a club of people, mm -hmm. uh, famously Ernest Hemingway, mm -hmm. Mark Twain, Alfred Nobel, I forget who the others are now, who live to see their own obituaries in the newspaper. And it makes you think a lot more about time, about the fact that you're reading a sentence that will one day be printed for real, for sure. Mm. I even say in the opening to my book, um, Presumably, somewhere, someone by now has actually written my obituary. Obituaries get written well in advance. Well, I was going to say, have you written the obituary for Kissinger or Ratzinger? No. I, I haven't. I also say in my book that I've done almost everything as a journalist, except be a sports writer, because I don't care about sports, mm -hmm. and be a, a writer of obituaries. I can write after people are dead, but I can't write while they're mm -hmm. still alive. My, my dear friend Edward Said, for example, who died of leukemia, um, caused me often to be rung up by people saying, you know, we need an obituary for Edward to be ready when he dies. Can you do it? I couldn't do it. Hmm. I just couldn't do it. It's a strange kind of reserve. I did write something about him when he passed on, as people say. Right. Part of the book that really resonated with me is, is you write, and it's in the first chapter, you write about your mom who um, committed suicide. Uh, I have a brother who committed suicide as well. and oh, I, It's certainly... It, it, it's. It's something that, unless you've sort of had it touched down in your life, it's it's um, it, it, one doesn't really sort of realize the impact it can have. In, in what what kind of an impact did it have on 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 you? My mother took her own life in a suicide pact with a, a lover 
after the failure of her marriage to my father, when she was still quite young. And I was terribly upset at the thought that someone as vivacious as her would or could ever get to a point where she would think there was no point in any further life. And that was succeeded by the feeling that I, who was very close to her, should have been able to give her some such reason. And I think I describe what I know I do in the book. The awful discovery I made in, in the hotel in Athens where she took her life, that because it was the old days of switchboards, I would, went through all the records, she'd made up several efforts to call my number in London, and I'd never been at home. And I, I've never been able to lose the feeling that she was probably calling in the hope of finding a handhold of some sort to cling to, and that if she'd heard my voice, because I could almost always make her laugh, in fact, I could invariably make her laugh, however blue she was, um, that I could have saved her. So as a result, I've never had what people like to call closure. It's remained an open... I think that word closure, though, is such a ridiculous word. I mean, so it's such a TV word. It's, yes. it's, every time I hear it, I feel it's people who speak it who have not lost anyone and don't understand that there is no such thing as... as there is no such thing, A, and B, it wouldn't be worth having if right. it were available because it would, all it would mean was that some quite important part of you had gone numb. Mm -hmm. And you think, oh, how nice, I don't feel anything about her anymore. No. It, well, actually, I want to read something else that, that you wrote in... Um, you said, I've been in denial for some time, knowingly burning, burning the candle at both ends and finding that it often gives a lovely light. But for precisely that reason, I can't see myself smiting my brow with shock or hear myself whining about how it's all so unfair. I've been taunting the reaper into taking a free scythe in my direction. I have now succumbed to something so predictable and banal that it bores even me. Rage would be beside the point for the same reason. Do, do you, fi you find this boring in a way? Yes. If, in fact, I sometimes think that's what will kill me. The, board, the, the, the mundane yeah, nature of it. Having to sit through chemotherapy, for example, is an almost zen experience of boredom. You can't do much except read. You don't feel great. And you, you're watching poison go into your arm. People are saying you should be struggling, battling cancer. You're not battling it. You couldn't be living a more passive moment than that. Uh, you feel as if you're drowning in powerlessness. But, but did you never ask that question, why me? Or, or is it a question well, you question, asked and you debated the, with the yourself? The question comes because you can't. It's not a matter of, of whether you think such things or not. It's a matter of how you react to them when they occur from your subconscious. You haven't actually thought it. It's just been flung at you. Why me? Well, why not is the best answer to that. It's a strong way of looking at things, though. I mean, it, there's, no, there's no pity involved. There's no self-pity. Hope not. That, that would Self-pity isn't, isn't going to help me. Um, but, but I hope I'd despise it if I thought that it would. Hence the refusal of prayer which is a form of self-pity and self-indulgence. It's as if the universe is all about you and responds to your entreaties. Um, I hardly, hardly think so. In a moment of doubt, isn't there... I don't know, I, I, find, I just find it fascinating that even when you're alone and you know, no one else is watching, that there might be a moment where you, you know, want to hedge your bets. If that comes, it'll be when I'm very ill. Um, when I'm half demented, either by drugs or by pain I won't have control over what I say. I mention this in case you ever hear a rumor later on. <laughs> um, because these things happen, and the faithful love to spread these rumors. You know, on his deathbed, he finally, well, I can't say that the entity that by then wouldn't be me wouldn't do such a pathetic thing. But I can tell you that not while I'm lucid, no. I could be quite sure of that. So if there is some story that on your deathbed... Don't believe it. Don't believe it. Don't credit it, no.